Thank you for joining us at Mechanics Institute for our online program, The Writer's Lunch. The Writer's Lunch is a casual and virtual brown bag lunch activity on the third Friday of each month. Look forward to craft discussion, informal presentations on all forms of writing, and excellent conversation. My name is Nico Chen, and I am the program manager here at Mechanics Institute. For those of you who are new to Mechanics Institute, welcome. Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. Mechanics Institute features a general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the Cinema Lit film series. A recent article in the San Francisco Standard describes us as the coolest library in downtown San Francisco and a remote work sanctuary. Come see this for yourself by joining us for a free tour, which happens every Wednesday at noon. This tour of Mechanics Institute will orient you to our building, include an overview of our history and mission, and outline our current services and benefits of membership. We also offer a plethora of free events for our Mechanics Institute members. Um, so you are also welcome to join us on a special evening tour tonight, Friday, November 17th, starting at 5 p.m. Light refreshments will be available during the welcome reception and complimentary beverages will be shared. If you are interested in registering for this event, I will be popping the link to this event in our chat box. There we are. And that is now in there. Um, we also offer a plethora of free events, including our first writer's read happening on site in our fourth floor meeting room on Friday, December 8th from 5 to 7 p.m. Step into this world of literary enchantments, an intimate evening of readings featuring members from our own writers groups. We'd like to extend an, a special offer to Writers Lunch attendees today. If you are interested in joining us for our inaugural Writers Read, you can get your ticket for free by using the promo code Writers Read. I will be popping the link to this event and the event code into our chat box. Uh, and here we go. Um, Actually, let me do that shortly, but let's continue on. We can, uh, you can learn more about a variety of other events by going to milibrary.org, click on events in our top menu bar and begin searching and registering for the events or course of your choice. Today's theme for the Writer's Lunch is food writing and telling heritage stories through food. This discussion moderated by Cheryl J. Bizet Boutet will include a Q and A with the audience. Please add your questions to the chat and I will read them out loud. And you're welcome to ask questions um, once the floor opens. Um, so um, I will start to read the bios of today's participants and our moderator, Cheryl J. Bazebute. Award-winning author and Pushcart Prize nominee, Cheryl J. Bazebute, is an Oakland multidisciplinary writer whose autobiographical and fictional short story collections along with her lyrical and stunning poetry, artfully succeed in getting across deeper meanings about the politics of race and economics without breaking out of the narrative. An inaugural Oakland Poet Laureate Runner-Up, um, uh, Laureate Runner -up, she is also a popular teacher, literary reader, presenter, storyteller, curator, and MC host for literary and poetry events. Our special guest is Viola Buitoni. She is a San Francisco-based chef instructor and food writer and was born in Rome and raised in Perugia, Italy. With stories, uh, let me admit all. With stories and knowledge from six generations, her recipes cross the best of local agriculture with Italian artisanal foods. Italy by ingredients, artisanal ingredients, modern recipes, which was published this year is her first cookbook. Viola teaches Italian modern home cooking classes virtually via Milk Street Cooking School in Boston and in person at 18 Reasons in the Civic Kitchen in San Francisco. In spring and fall, she leads immersive culinary tours through off the beaten path Italy. In 2020, the president of the Italian Republic awarded her the title of Cavaliere dell'Ordine della Stella d'Italia for her work to further the culture and business of Italian food. She lives in San Francisco's Mission District with her husband, son, and tiny dog. Camper English is a San Francisco-based cocktails and spirits writer and educator named one of the biggest names in the cocktail world by Vanity Fair. 
He, he has contributed to publications including Popular Science, Saveur, the San Francisco Chronicle, Eater, Whiskey Advocates, The Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, and many more. He is the author of Doctors and Distillers, The Remarkable Med Medicinal History of Beer, Wine, Spirits, and Cocktails. His most recent book, The Ice Book, Cool Cubes, Clear Spheres, and Other Chill Cocktail Crafts, has been named the ultimate guide to clear ice and reached the top 50 best-selling books on Amazon. His website is alkademics.com. Last but not least, we have Henry Su. Henry Su is a food storyteller and passionate ambassador of foods originally from Taiwan. Henry enthusiastically explores his Taiwanese heritage through the lens of food, cooking, teaching, and sharing his journey to identify what is Taiwanese. With a Gulf Coast upbringing, Midwestern education, and years of living in Latin America, his Taiwan food heritage has been the cornerstone in all phases of his life, from immigration to assimilation to seeking his personal cultural identity. Henry teaches dumpling making classes around the Bay and hosts Taiwanese pop-up dinners as Arama Sama dumplings. Henry most recently worked at Dumpling Club in the Mission District in San Francisco, and for the Oakland tofu maker Hodo Foods, where he inspired many chefs across the country to put tofu on their menu. Besides dumpling making, Henry is known for his Northern California interpretation of the national dish of Taiwan, beef noodle soup. Obsessive in using locally grown, responsibly, and deliciously sourced ingredients, his transcultural food recipes manifest his Taiwanese roots while proudly bridging in all things Bay Area. It is such a blessing to have all of y'all joining us here today for Writer's Lunch today. Cheryl, I'll hand it off over to you. Thank you so much, Nico. And I have to also say, I am really honored to have Henry, Viola, and Camper here with us today. Uh, you wouldn't have known this, and I don't know how it happened, but I guess it's just destiny, that the three of you represent the three favorite things in my household. Good Italian food, good cocktails, and good dumplings. So thank you all so much. Let me start by asking my, my first general question. Um, I would like each of you to tell us a bit about your journey into writing about food or telling stories about food, uh, which I'm going to call stories and writing about edibles and drinkables. Uh, Viola, could you start? Yes, I'm happy to. And thank you. Thank you for liking Italian food, Cheryl. Oh, uh, hey. <laughs> so I started, I came to uh, writing mostly via teaching. I have been a cooking instructor for about 15 years and a food Italian food professional for many more than that. But um, when motherhood came along 19 years ago, all of a sudden my shift, um, my, my focus shifted. And I thought that uh, first of all, I really wanted to share knowledge and pass it on to the next generation. And also, um, and also I felt like I no longer wanted to work evenings and weekends and holidays. So I shifted to uh, teaching and all of a sudden I felt like this is really what I was meant for. Like all this work that I have done in, in food had led me to the point of teaching, which I to this day adore, uh, notwithstanding having done it for close to 15 years. I gathered, as you can understand, a lot of uh, material during, during these 15 years of teaching. And I perfected the way that I talk to people by taking um, by taking their cues. So I always say that if a question is asked by one of my students more by any students more than twice, then I'm doing something wrong. I have to go back to the drawing board and rewrite the way that I say things or bring in new elements which will make people understand. Um, uh, little by little, this part of, of uh, teaching that I dealt with quite a bit, which was writing recipes and telling stories around them, because stories really kind of make people remember, mm -hmm. um, became one of the main things um, in my teaching life. And eventually it uh, morphed into a book. Wow. See, writers, this is how things happen. How about you, Camper? What's your journey been? 
Uh, well, <laughs> it's been a roundabout journey, that is for sure. Uh, writing is my third career. Um, I first was, I studied uh, physics in undergrad and did some scientific research. And then I went to grad school for computer science and did a little bit of that for a few years. But for the past 20 or so years, I have been writing about drinks. And that really came about because it was just something I was interested in. Um, I really like uh, drinking a cocktail or two or three. And uh, I was paying attention to bars and at the time nightclubs and things like that. I started to do some reviews for fun initially. And then eventually I was doing full-time reviewing of more nightlife. However, the craft cocktail renaissance that we're in started bubbling up. Um, at around 2006 to 2008, and I was paying close attention to it and starting to write more about that. And I moved away from nightlife into just a focus on cocktails and the construction of them and learning from bartenders what they knew. And then eventually uh, that transformed into me becoming a bit of an expert and being able to share what I had learned um, and what I've read in all of those books. And uh, to start teaching a little bit about it, which is um, more what I do now um, than than just writing. Um, so I do a little bit of, of all of it, but yeah, it was an, an unexpected journey. I would never have guessed that I'd uh, become a person who wrote for a living. But you know, Kem Kemper, it's all science, right? It, it sure is. You never <laughs> really left your roots, did you? <laughs> I, d I didn't. And as I said, <laughs> alcohol is a solution. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> My daughter is a neuroscientist, so that we I live with that. Okay, Henry, what's been what's your journey been into the drinkables and telling stories about them? Um, I guess um I'll try to be quick. I I shorten my version of that, about this a little bit, but um. I think a big part of it is just loving to eat um, yeah. and uh, being a person who likes to eat and and it has a lot of questions about why things are the way they are. I think part of it is being an immigrant, a young immigrant coming as a baby to this country in the early 70s and kind of not seeing our family's food right. anywhere out and about. My family is originally from Taiwan so most of the Chinese food that we would see in <laughs> of Cantonese origin. So, um, you know, my family was very into food and into my grandfather, they migrated with us and grew vegetables in the backyard. My grandmother did all the cooking. And, um, but we were not in the kitchen. We were studying, like it was just about uh, eating and consuming. Um, so, and my background has been re relatively circuitous. I studied anthropology. Um, I, in Latin American studies, I worked in, I eventually went to architecture school. I worked in public health. I was doing furniture design. I, mig I moved to Ecuador in 2007. I always loved to cook. Um, but then what happened was when I was in Ecuador, similarly to my family migrating to the States in the 70s, I found myself needing to learn how to make everything I wanted to eat. Yeah. So, um, but then throughout all of that, it was always the question mark, what is Taiwanese food or what is that about or where does it come from and how is that? I never thought about things as regional Chinese cuisine here and there, but um, so while I was in Ecuador working in architecture and furniture design, with an NGO, um, I was cooking and learning how to make dumpling skins and all my own pantry items and kind of sourcing whatever I could find in the Andes um, that would be similar uh, to the food that I wanted. And then I decided to move back to the States and transition to food um, professionally. And then, I thought, and then I started doing pop-ups on the side, my own little things and teaching dumpling classes. And that's where I started um, realizing I needed to do research and find stories and understand mm -hmm. um, where things came from. My family didn't really talk about food, so it was kind of 
all self-discovery. And in the last 15 years, this kind of learning dishes, writing them down, going to Taiwan, working with my aunts um, who do cook and um, kind of learning how to tell stories. I don't have a book. I've not published much. I've written a few small things kind of explaining basics about Taiwanese stuff. But um, I'm just happy to say in the last 15 years, I've started seeing a generation of Taiwanese food writers that are starting to, and for the most part, grapple with the same issues about um, why is this food here and where is it from and why do we not know about it and why are we all seeking out the same thing? And I'll just like, Wow. He's American and in uh, food writers, and they've literally all been published in the last, besides two, um, wow. 2015 and 18. Um, for the most part, they've all been published in the last two years, and they all have similar stories. So it's interesting to kind of see how our generation um, has started to kind of try to tease that all out. So it's the beginning of storytelling. It's the beginning of explaining what this regional cuisine is and why it exists. So. Well, you know, Henry, your your mission around food is very, very clear and absolutely wonderful and needed. I, I want to stay with you for a minute. I want to uh, follow a follow up question with you. Um, some some people say that uh, writing about food and telling food stories goes way beyond the recipe. And I, I think you've kind of touched on that. But what are your main ingredients for your stories? I tend to, I'm not entirely academic. I've done research um, on certain cultural things that have, that are a part of Taiwanese identity. And that's, if people follow Taiwan, um, it's a little bit complicated because some of it's cultural, some of it's political, and some of it's um but um, but the ingredients for my storytelling are pretty personal, and I'll start with the personal, and then I'll talk about, then I'll delve into history that I can find, um, and in that's in English that's available to me because I don't read and write in Chinese, um, and then talk to people about how things have come to be, and then when I share those stories, whether I'm teaching a class or an Instagram post where I used to grapple with like writing these long things to describe a dish mm -hmm. like, anywhere else. Um, I um, I try to tailor it towards, now there's more people that are not of Taiwanese descent who are curious about it because they're hearing about it more in this country. And then otherwise for Taiwanese American folks or immigrants like me who are discovering it's, Everyone talks about how there's a taste first that they've had since childhood, but they can't find anywhere because they're not, it's not readily available. And so that's a really emotional thing. And then that'll propel me into talking about um, where that comes from and why. And, you know, we're in California or I was in Ecuador before. What kind of substitutes are there? And right you treat that and talk about identity or authentic so-called authenticity or tradition or whatever so um those are all interesting things to me related to food but taste is the key yes um, to kind of draw people in i suppose uh how about you camper what are your main ingredients for a story about spirits well for me I'm really concerned with the uh, the why of things, uh, how things work at the end. Um, if one distillery has one type of still and another has another type of still, how will that translate into a different tasting product at the end? So I like taking things apart. It's a curiosity on how things work. Um, and if I could never write cocktail recipes again, that would be fine with me because I figure you can go look it up. What I want to know, maybe uh, how a spirit came about, given its uh, mm -hmm. history and uh, its use, and specifically in medicine and from the Doctors and Distillers book, or uh, in the case of the ice book, it was figuring out how water freezes uh, yeah. and <laughs> how we could take Less advantage science. of that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so it really comes uh, a 
a, a, a point of uh, curiosity about taking things apart and figuring out how they work and then putting them back together to explain for other people. That's, that's really what brings me joy. Wow. How about you, Viola? I think I come to it from two sides. So one is the side where I want to teach people. So that is quite important to me. Um, I want people to come away with a, with a real skill, both in my classes and from reading my book. Um, the other one is a kind of a, another side of the coin that uh, um, Henry is describing. So finding, refinding and reclaiming your e heritage. So I don't need to refine my heritage because my family is all in Italy. And because we talk about food all the time, <laughs> it is probably about 80% of what we talk about. Um, so but what I do feel sometimes is that I need to reclaim it because I, I think that uh, Italian food is probably the most claimed um, in the States in terms of, of how people cook daily. Uh, there are so many elements of Italian food that are often distorted. And even in those people who kind of pride themselves on, on making quote unquote authentic or real Italian food, there is an element of Italy that is brought in that it is not the Italy that I grew up in and the Italy that I know. Um, I find that often we want to, um, not we, but people like to have a very poeticized view of Italy. And we, um, everybody wants to think of like this, this heaven and this Shangri-La where you have this sweet life where you do nothing in reality and, and just be happy and, you know, have, have cocktails and wine and eat. Um, in reality, Italy is, is a bustling country, is a country where life can be very hard and where uh, traditions of culture are both very layered and established, but also very fraught and, and difficult and also very, in, very influenced on what is happening in the world today. And very often it seems that there is a part of the, uh, of the press and the writing world that does not want to recognize that because it doesn't... Um, it doesn't look good. It doesn't sell. So I think yeah. that I can reclaim all that and still make it a very appealing place uh, because Italy is very appealing exactly because of its um, of its conflict and of its uh, contradictions. And that to me is the most interesting part of my heritage and the one that I try to try to tell in my stories. The other part, the understanding of the teaching is um is the sensorial part. So when I think of, of cooking, uh, of course, yes, I think of, of grams and measures and cups and timing, but I also think of what happens to my body when I cook. And that is a much more uh, common language for people than anything else. So, so you can tell people you can cook it two minutes or you can tell someone you should be cooking it about two minutes, but mostly this is what you are looking for, listening for, touching for, and smelling for. And that is a much more common language that anyone can understand because we all have a body and we all have sensations. Um, and so that is one of the ways to which, uh, through which I come to in my storytelling around food. You just really slid right into my next question so beautifully. Thank you. Uh, what are some of the uh, writing and storytelling techniques that you use for getting the reader to taste and smell what you're cooking? Um, well, so I always introduce my recipe with a little head note that harks back to a personal story. Um, so I always, very many years ago, when I was at New York University, I had a teacher who said uh, the first the first sentence needs to draw the reader in right away. So I always have a first sen sentence or a first paragraph that is want, wants to make the reader uh, go on and say, oh, wait, hold on a second. I, there's obviously an answer, then a question that needs answering here. Let me see what it is. Um, the other technique that I use is to um, take the sensorial out of the food world. So I will give you a small example. Mm. Uh, one of the things that I also always recommend people do with their ingredients is that they smell them, especially when you talk about staples like cereals, right? We all think, oh, you know, cereals or pulses, they can stay on our, on our, on our shelves forever. 
That's mm. really not the case. And uh, let's take rice, for example. Once you open rice and take it out of its vacuum, it's got about a three month shelf life. It's not right. going to last forever. And so I always tell people to smell it first to the point that um, in I, I save a, a cup of rice that has gone off in my class so that people can smell that first and then the fresh rice. And so what I tell them is that fresh rice smells like barely gathered dust and kind of like a spring morning where you kind of see the flecks of dust and a rice that has passed its prime is going to smell like dirt that has, that has accumulated like cobwebs and like you know dust mites and so this is not something that you think about when you're cooking but it is a a, a smell that you can be familiar with and you can understand no matter you know no matter whether you're a cook or not so that is another one of the techniques that I like to use. Immersive. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. How about how about you, Camper? Um, well, I think I'm far less sensory than, than uh, Viola in my, in my writing. I want you to uh, be curious as to the complexity of the situation, because I think complexity makes things taste better. Uh, that's could be just me. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't have a huge audience. <laughs> but um, uh, I, you know, like, okay, it's a gin and tonic. It, it tastes good. We drink it. But the gin and tonic is made of malaria cure, a scurvy cure, and a plague cure. Um, and we can pull those apart and look at the history of each one and find out why this drink is special and actually magical and a whole bunch of different circumstances happen in order to uh, have these things available that are now combined in the glass and we're just having it on a summer day but like but if you think about it it's it's get tastes even better and richer and full of history and science and <laughs> and medicine and magic um so that's that's what gets me uh uh, the the tease is of oh there's so much more and it gets so much more interesting right it just didn't come here this way there, right. there there's a legacy there's a history wonderful how about you henry um for me in at least in the recipe writing or or teaching or talking about uh taiwanese food in general um one of the things um we often think of taste but then the sensorial aspect, you know, and obviously we all talk about taste and smell being uh, connected. And, um, but the other thing that we talk about a lot in Taiwanese food or maybe Chinese food in general is texture. So, mm -hmm. um, and I, so, you know, looking at recipes and teaching myself through recipes um, that are available to me in English, again, because I don't speak, uh, read and write in Chinese, um, I never found certain things that I learned later um, when I went to Taiwan or, and now I'm starting to see people talk about it more is the textural aspects um, of what you want to achieve when you're cooking. Um, quite often in our culture, we may say, people may ask you not how did that taste or was it good? The first thing they'll say is, was it some kind of texture? Like they'll ask right. about the texture. And the fam most famous one in Taiwan is, QQ, if you people have heard about that, QQ is like a, um, it's a term that refers to uh, the chewiness or akin to Italian pasta being al dente, cooked al dente. Um, so I feel like half the recipe should be written on how you achieve a certain texture by technique, which I think is uh, lost in a lot of recipes these days. Yeah, our food, but um. So I think that's just an interesting addition to talking about how to um, share food recipes and how to achieve making something. So wonderful, Nico. Do we have any audience questions? Currently, we actually don't. Um, so I highly recommend for our audience to sort of think about what their inquiry is and pop in those questions into the texts. Um, I actually have, oh, Cheryl, do you have another question that you might be able to ask during this? Oh, sure. You know, I always have questions. <laughs> uh, let me just say, I have a, a story 
uh, that involves a conversation between a mother and her daughter. And it's quite a heavy duty conversation. I mean, they're trying to work out some things. And inside of that story, the mother is standing at the stove making gumbo. So as the discussion goes on, the gumbo's being made and certain techniques and recipes and, and you know, ingredients are being shared until we get to the end of both the uh, conversation and the making of the gumbo. So my question for the panel is, do you wrap your stories in the food or do you wrap your food in the stories? And, or do you do both? How, how do you engage the words that you want to say and um, write with what you're conveying and what you're making? Um, Camper? Uh, I would say for, for me specifically, I'm really an explainer and I'm <laughs> trying to, uh, I gather information and collate it and uh, bring different points together and then try to be very clear and succinct and really just tell you <laughs> something rather yeah. than, I don't, I don't know that I would consider myself a storyteller rather than, um, I don't know, a how-to writer or something like that. At least that's how it feels in my head because uh, I feel like I, the words I'm going to use are going to be simple um, and then allow you to ruminate on the concepts behind them and and that what makes it special to you and maybe it's just because I'm not terribly good at that at using more <laughs> evocative sensory words to, to describe um, the actual flavor of things but um, to explain what's special in order for that to make you feel special and make that beverage feel special to you or just look better in the case of nice ice cubes. <laughs> ah, nice. I, I like the nice. Ice. My daughter would really appreciate that. I have to find that one. Uh, Viola. Um, so I would say that I do a little bit of both, but yeah. I always come to it from the idea of teaching people how to cook. So the story comes into the food and it's um, in my teaching career, it started coming into the food more and more strongly because I saw that people reacted to it with a better sense of memory. So that if I told the story about, you know, how my um, how my brother would make a certain type of risotto because that was a good way to win the heart of a girl that he was in love with, um, people remember more they you know they find that a very a catch it's it's almost like a tune right when you have you have a right. tune that goes a jingle that goes with a advertisement um it's a story that goes with a recipe because that brings in that really fixes it in in your head um and so that is i would say that i definitely wrap the story into the food for the most part also stories to me are um because we were talking about heritage stories to me are a way to always recognize the giants on whose shoulder I stand on, like my mother and some of her friends and grandmothers, um, and even, even my dad and, and my family that has been in food for six generations. So it's a good way of, um, of making sure that people understand that I'm fully aware of the good luck and privilege I've had of having this, this tradition and this heritage in my life um, that has brought me here. Here, here. Wonderful. How about you, Henry? I have a lot of storytelling um, and I need to learn how to, um, yeah, tone it down. And, but that's kind of my interest and impetus in discovering a dish or trying to figure out how a dish works. Um, so I kind of tend to wrap a lot of storytelling around the dish, but, um, but when I'm teaching, it can, it, depending on the the students, it can be a good thing or a bad thing. I need to learn how to like do more technical for some classes and then more storytelling for others. But um, so I'm kind of in between there a little bit and trying to figure out how to do that better and hold the, and be more succinct. Um, but oh, you were very I succinct. Like the story. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great. Do we have any questions, Nico? 
We sure do. Um, so Ty Swackhammer was curious about how videos and you know text recipes might differ from each other. So she, her question is, do you do both videos and texts? And what are the pros and cons of each of those mediums? Henry? Um, for me, I think video is really good. And I think uh, the pandemic was uh, helpful kind of to train us all to be able to set up our remote talking and cooking stations and teaching stations. So um, it's, uh, I it's and it's interactive um, in a different way, obviously, than what Tice is asking about, um, you know, just reading something and having potentially a lot of questions. But um, video often allows you to um, put in a lot of nuance and obviously you're showing technique and um, doing things. So yes, I think in this day and age, both are interesting um important to um to be kind of in the in, yeah anyway. to be in the mix yeah yeah how about you camper um i find well a lot of my decision making around those uh, has to do with finances and, and what pays um 99 point and whatever percent of all video is is free content that you, that you're giving right. away and uh what my hope is anyway is that i'm driving views and traffic back to the things that people pay for which might be classes or book sales or um just uh increasing awareness for my you know personal brand so that people hire me for uh, more of those things as well as for writing so for me, video is is almost an advertisement for what I really like to do and what pays me better um, because I don't have my own sort of sold video platform where I do content yeah. that, that people pay for on that. So that's how my, I would like, I would love to not do video, uh, but uh, it is the future. Absolutely. Like you have to do video if you're, a, if you want to be a writer, you're going to be a talker too. I think it's. Right. Built in. Exactly. What about you, Viola? I I love video. I really do. I I love speaking in public. I, I, it's a great way to connect to people. Um, but for me, they are two things that need to coexist. It, just think of the idea of a movie and a book, right? So you you read a book and then you see the movie, and you probably get something from both. Uh, but what you do get from a book and from words is is depth, which you right. do not get from a video because a video by definition cannot cannot be too long because with a video we are gathering to a changing audience. We always have to think of the length of it so that if I wanted to tell all the things I tell in my book, it, they will probably be like 90 minutes long videos. No one's going to look <laughs> at a 90 minute long video, right? So um, in order to in order to shorten that, uh, then I think you lose a lot of the depth and the beauty and the, and the imaginative way in which you can talk about food and the stories that connect to it. Um, so for me, I see them as as both necessary and as Camper was saying, also a little bit of an advertising, telling people, okay, this is what I need to offer for like a very quick you know quick meal today. If you want to know more, come and and read my book. Um, so that's that's how I tend to think of video, but I do love it. It is a mean that I absolutely adore. I just, you know, I love putting on a show. So it works for me. Good, great. Any other questions, Nico? We sure do. Um, Alyssa is asking, what are your suggestions for writing about food or drinks in a way that translates for a reader? Since, you know, in the text, there's no taste, smell, touch, nada, right? So what is the process to create all that in a reader's imagination? Camper. Hmm. <laughs> because I how don't... Do I taste that, how do I taste that gin and tonic? Right. Uh, well, that is up to you. Uh, my, my style <laughs> of writing is is more like to get you to go taste it for yourself, I suppose. But um, I, I'm my reader. Uh, I find something that's interesting and I want to talk to other people who might find that interesting as well. So as far as translating it, like if I can explain it in a way that makes sense to me, 
then it will make sense to my sort of ideal reader who is a fellow nerd. I'm not trying to teach someone who doesn't know what a gin and tonic tastes like, right. what a gin and tonic tastes like. I'm, right. It's so interesting. You're going to want to try it for yourself is, is kind of how I approach it. So I feel like I, rather than trying to bring a lot of readers in, I'm actually trying to uh, filter them out and get uh, only uh, people who are interested in my sort of extreme level nerditry of uh, what I'm uh, what I find interesting. Right. Henry. Um, again, I'm kind of wrapped up in the stories behind a dish. So that will be what my writing is about. And then I really love photography. So um, I love um, good photography of a dish, whether or not you know exactly what it's going to taste like can evoke a lot of anticipation. So um, I I think that's, if it's something in print, um, and if, you know, there are good cookbooks without any photography, but um, it's nice to have good. Great. So the visuals along with the words, yeah. Viola? Well, I spend a lot of time um, uh, shutting off one sense and privileging the other so that I can really deeply understand what the sensations that I get are and how to best describe, best describe them. Um, so that's that's my technique. So I, you know, I often cook with my eyes closed or I will like mm. put something on my nose so that I cannot smell. I'll put something on my ear so that I cannot hear. And then really kind of focus on one sense and really call out uh, the words that best describe it. Um, and then put them on the page. Ooh, interesting. Wonderful. Nico, another question? Yes, we have another question um, from, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Chiara Andreas. <laughs> um, so she said, speaking of a conflictual Italian image, immigration is a prevalent political issue, as in the rest of Europe. Is immigrant influence making its way into Italian cuisine? Ah, question for you, Viola. Yeah, I love this question. Thank you, Chiara. Um, it is it is it is a segue of what I was uh, speaking about earlier, kind of like you know claiming a heritage that everyone is wanting to own. Um, yes, the answer, the brief answer is yes, um, and uh, immigration definitely making its way into the into the Italian cooking, both when it comes to ingredient as well as to techniques and preparation, and also in terms of enlarging. Uh, the the visuals, the just kind of like the curiosity of people in Italy, because Italians really like good food. And what we look at more is not um, where it comes from, but how it was made along the way, right? So it's really about the respect of production. And then it is saying, oh, it comes from another country. It, that that's, that's interesting. But also what is interesting is... Um, what what is the sustainability of it how good are the ingredients and how they're put together so um and food the other part is that food has become a very very uh, political issue in italy hugely political because as people may know in this in this chat um italy has unfortunately a rising uh, right right wing government and the right-wing government has a, a, appropriated this sort of, uh, this idea of food sovereignty. And instead of making it in, inclusive, it made it exclusive. And so it's saying, you know, it's sovereignty and it's our food and it's where it comes from. And it should come from very close to us and be and be um, close to our, to our heritage and to our traditions. The left wing says, no, you know, we should welcome everybody who's here. They have their own tradition. We have a, a country where we can produce anything. And so we should come, we should in, accommodate that. And I find that younger generations are more and more open to that. In fact, I will tell you that the most popular uh, food among kids right now is sushi. So my nephews and nieces in Italy, they go out and they say, Zia, we're going out. I'm like, oh, great. What are you going to eat? And I'm thinking, they'll say, oh, pizza or whatever. They say, no, we're going for sushi. That's what they all want. And they're, they're very curious, younger people are very curious about it. And I think it is a, a very important way of opening 
um, opening the mind, mind to the reality of others and, and also counteracting this sense of just um, closeness and exclusion that unfortunately is pervading some of the uh, some of some parts of Italy. Great, thank you. What a what a whew, rich legacy and a lot of good information. I see we have another question, Nico. Yes, um, we have Kimberly Tan who is asking, what are some food stories or stories about drinks that you hope to see more of in general? and specifically from future generations of food writers and storytellers? Ah, great question. Hey, let's start with the cocktails. Camper? <laughs> Certainly. <clears throat> well, the, it, I got great news because a lot of the books that I want to see are uh, hitting the market now and in next year. Uh, the world of alcohol production and cocktails and all of that is very much uh, male writers. Uh, all of the cocktail books um, until recently were written by white men for the most part. Um, but now as of, I think literally this week, there's a new book about uh, the Black contribution to cocktails, mm -hmm. um, and particularly in America. And then there are uh, at least two women um, historical cocktail uh, analyses coming out next year. And uh, it's great that we're bringing in um, the other voices and the research that takes to find those voices is super, super interesting. So I, I love deeply researched um, topics like this and, and, and they're coming and I couldn't be more happy about it. Wonderful. How about you, uh, Henry? Um, I have a lot of, cookbooks, probably not as many as Camper or Viola here. Um, but I really like reading stories and memoirs. So sometimes I'll go through, I don't have, you know, I haven't gone through all of the recipes and all of the books that I own, but um, I tend to kind of look for storytelling. Um, so I, I really enjoy um, books that are kind of more memoir focused, related to food. Um, cause related I like to food, yeah how people discover things and why they've highlighted certain things and kind of brought them to light. So um, uh, Fuchsia Dunlop, who's just here in the Bay Area um, and launched, has a new book out, um, Invitation to a Banquet. Um, but one of her original um, food uh, books was uh, Shark's Fin and um, Shark's Fin and something, Fish on Peppercorn. Anyway, it was a memoir about how she came to love uh, Sichuanese food. And I find it to be one of the most compelling. Now I'm, you know, after reading that uh, several years ago, it was kind of pulled me into that world through food. Um, so now when I eat it over the years, it kind of brings me back to things that, you know, she felt like she discovered at a time when maybe China was not that open, for example. So um, travel, memoir, writing, food related. That's uh, inspiration all around us. How about you, Viola? I am really uh, loving watching books a little bit from people a little bit like me who are very recent immigrants and who are still grappling with what it means to be um, very much from a culture, but also very much into the other. Um, I find that they bring a, that they bring a view of the world which is which is interesting. You know, those of us who they call us expats, they call us recent immigrants. That they have lots of uh, lots of words for us, but there are many, right? Not just from Europe, yeah. like myself, but from all over the world. People who have like their whole family still in country of origin, but they live here and they've lived here for many years, and so to a, to an extent, they have. Um, they have absorbed this culture and they live in it and maybe their children live in it. Like my kid was born and raised in San Francisco. And so they have, um, they have had to claim their food um, in a way that makes them feel that they, they are in, in both, um, in both places in the right way. Um, so that is very, it's very interesting to me because it is something that I struggle with all the time. You know, I spend lot, lots of time in Italy and lots of time here all my siblings are there, but my kid is American, but he's also Italian. And <laughs> yeah. So there is the, the kind of like the constant longing and the constant having to just bring these two things together. And so to me, it, watching how other people deal with it is, is quite interesting. Oh, good stuff, Viola. Thank you. I, I see we have a question maybe for Camper. 
We do, but I want to go to SK's question first because it relates to everybody, and we'll end with Camper's question. But um, SK's question is, are there any special food-related fictional films that you all like? And she specifically says not documentaries. <laughs> Wonderful question. Uh, let's, let me start with Camper. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I, it would be up to me to, to find a drink one uh, for, for that answer to that question. And I'm sure there are, but uh, I, I can't come up with it right now. So I'll, I'll deflect. Like <laughs> you know what comes to my mind is um what it was the movie called Cocktail? Oh oh sure. That started that launched so <laughs> many oh, career bartenders who are still around today. They saw the movie Cocktail it, and they wanted them? to be cool and flip bottles around. Yeah, break <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you, Henry? Any movies? The two that just kind of pop up in my head are Eat Drink Man Woman by Ang Lee. And ah. um and then another one which is even more visceral to me was um Tampopo, the yeah. Japanese film about ramen, opening a ramen shop. Right. Viola. Um well I, I find that uh French film are especially good at, at uh, defining the way that food uh, intertwines into everyday living, both in a in a you know, very good traditional way, but also sometimes in a very absurd way. So I'm going all the way back, thinking of Luis Buñuel in the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, where everybody's sitting around the table and no one can ever leave. And there is all this food that comes ah. in. Um, yeah, so they're very, uh, they're really very interesting at bringing food in both as a joy, but also as a uh, kind of like a, as, as a trap that you need to navigate all the time. So yeah, it's still that contrast, right? The tension between uh, what is, what is, and what should be, what shouldn't be that that I really speaks to me. Great. I, I guess I'll, I, I would like to answer that question too, because my favorite right now is the bear. The, that mixture of the love of food and um, people trying to be true to the recipe uh, with the mixture of, of business and all of that, what all of that entails. So yeah, I really like that. And, and let's not forget eating Raul if you want to go weird. <laughs> okay. And Any we'll get to uh, we a that question for Camper. For Camper. Mm -hmm. So Camper, we have a question from Savannah and she asks, which cocktail do you think has the coolest story or history? Ah, well, good one. Yes, and of course I can't just give a simple answer, but I will try to make it quick. Um, I think if you want to go ingredient by ingredient uh, to come together in a cocktail, the Corpse Survivor number two has a lot of fascinating parts going on, each with their own history, and absinthe is one of those ingredients. Wow. You know that gets uh, kind of kooky. Yeah. Um, as far as the drink that inspires the most thought, that's the martini for sure. People love to uh, ruminate on the meaning of that drink more than any other cocktail that's ever been created. And then as far as a uh, cocktail that makes a point in history that creates a line, uh, that's the old fashioned, which is actually when the cocktail was defined, it is the old fashioned as we know it today. Um, and the reason its name changed is a long story and all of that, but it's sort of um, a specific point in history from which we can draw the line to everything uh, before and afterwards. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. It reminds me of the history of rum. Have you ever gotten into that one, Capper? Oh, for sure. The, there's yeah. a wonderful book uh, and bottle of rum um, that's yeah. uh, about that that history specifically. That's that's very good. Rum rum always has uh, a, an amazing, uh, an important, and significant and terrible history. <laughs> the history of the world is the history of rum, right? Sure so is. Um, and I have uh, another question that I'd like to ask. What would each of you give as advice to aspiring uh, food or drinkable writers? How, how would you advise them to get started on this particular topic? Camper, I have you on the screen, so let me start with you. Um, 
if you if you want to uh, get paid for it, uh, the, I think the uh, easiest way to do that is to identify a trend and then pitch a story on a trend. So um, right now, non-alcoholic cocktails are are big and commanding a lot of attention. So you could find a, a more specific trend, like three bars have a, a non-alcoholic Negroni on the menu and you go to uh, any of the journalism sites and pitch that story. I think the fastest way in uh, is identifying a trend and all you have to do is explain it. You don't even have to uh, be that of a writer. That's my secret. <laughs> well, but, but research too, right? Yeah, when the research is great fun. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and the testing of the research, right? <laughs> Well, how about you, Henry? What advice would you give to the aspiring storyteller writer? I think um, coming at it from your own perspective, like whether you're nerdy and into the science of it or into the technique or into the storytelling, I, you know, those are just being authentic to why you're doing it. Like, I think you can tell when you, I have certain um, cookbooks that, that are, you know, come from those different angles and you can hear and trust what they're saying. And then you find other ones that are kind of flat and dry and kind of trying to discover everything. So um, I think just coming at it from your own personal perspective, which I think makes it a more interesting endeavor to pursue. Um, so I think that will come out. Great. Final product, so. Viola? Uh, well, I would say, and this is also directly to Henry, that um, just do it. Like you need to sit down and start writing. Yeah. And for me, it was the, um, it was, of course, the writing of the recipes that really kind of got me there. But whatever it is, whichever, whether you approach it from campers standpoint, which is like a great way to approach it, um, or just, you know, coming in from saying, oh, I really have so many stories to tell. You just have to sit down and you have to start writing them and you have to start telling them. So the best way to um, to write is actually doing it like Saturday, an hour every day and just do it. And just do it. Yeah. Love it. Any closing thoughts or things you'd like to share? Viola, I'll start with you. Well, I was honored to be there. And I just, if I, if I may, I'd like to uh, show people my book. <laughs> Please hold that book up. Yes. <laughs> Here it is. So it's called oh, it's Italy beautiful. Buying. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely thank you. <laughs> thank you. And it's divided in 12 chapters, each of them highlighting either um, one ingredient or more ingredient and their contextualization, both in, in my experience as well as in their geographical and historical um, way, and then have suggestions on how to shop for them and use them in the kitchen with recipes. So are you, uh, do we have in the chat uh, information on how people can get the book? Uh, well, um, anywhere books are sold. The locally there is Omnivore Books and most most bookstores around have them. And if you want to get them online, I always suggest that people go to bookshop.org. Okay, great. Camper, any closing thoughts? Uh, you can also find my books at Omnivore Books on Food, um, uh -huh. and, as well as bookshop.org. Uh, um, and uh, thanks for attending, everyone. And Henry. Um, I uh, All I can say is if you're curious and want to carry on the conversation, um, you can find me at Arama Sama Dumplings on Instagram. That's the most active place I am and where I write and talk about things unless you're in a class of mine. And um, and I can also share with you, uh, if you're more if you're curious about Taiwanese regional food, um, and then you can be um, it's just amazing again that they all, the Taiwanese American books came out in the last few years. So um, after, you know, anyway, so thank you. I want to add my thanks to all of you for being here with us today. This has been um, just such a rich experience. Uh, it has made me very, very hungry and very, very thirsty. And I have to say, I wish I had some of each of what you all put together <laughs> right now. <laughs> thank you so much. It has been an honor and a pleasure. And thank you, Mechanics Institute, Nico and Alyssa.
Of course, and I also just out there. And I also want to just uh, remind us to mark your calendars for our next writers lunch on Friday, December fifteenth, on the topic of the value of writing retreats with Matthew Felix, Joey Garcia, and Janice Cook Newman. Um, this event will, of course, be moderated by Cheryl once again, and the link is in the chat. Uh, I wanted to just give a warm round of applause to our wonderful guest speakers today. And we are just so blessed that you are here today speaking with us about this wonderful topic. Thank you. All right, bye, y'all.